Most African pygmies live in dense tropical forests which lie along the Congo River in Central Africa. Forests with towering trees that almost shut out the blazing equatorial sun. Beneath these trees, a tangled mass of vines, heavy with vegetation in almost perpetual gloom. Here is found the rare night ape, or bush baby, a shy creature which prowls about the branches in the gloom. And the scaly anteater, repelling in appearance, but a toothsome delicacy to the natives. Within the forests dwell the pygmies, a dwarf-like people, brown-skinned and shy. Here is a pygmy woman starting to build a hut, which the tribe uses temporarily in its forest wanderings in search of game. The pygmies usually live out of doors, but they build shelters just before the rainy season, which is now approaching. How skillfully the hands interlace the viney framework. Now with this completed, the pygmy woman orders one of her children to bring leaves for a covering. Large, thick magongo leaves, almost like tiles or shingle when arranged in double thickness. These magongo leaves are attached to the framework by slits, which have been made in the central rib of each leaf. has been completed, it will keep the hut interior dry under the most violent tropical rains. As a finishing touch, branches are added. These help to hold the roof of leaves in place. The house is now complete, and the family promptly moves in. In the moist heat of the tropical forest, the pygmies always keep a fire going usually to dry themselves and also occasionally to cook their food. Securing vegetables for food is comparatively easy. This one, with baby and homemade basket, will not have far to search for materials which ages of experience have taught the pygmies are good for food. She finds here a vine of apa. Its tuberous roots are somewhat like sweet potatoes but the upper vine does not require cultivation. The digging knife and other tools the pygmies use are obtained in trade with nearby Congo tribes. Another pygmy woman is gathering the fruits of the Tewe vine. They, likewise, go into the homemade basket. Thus, instead of shopping at markets or cultivating gardens, Pigmen get their fruits and vegetables directly from the dense forests in which their villages are located. With the securing of vegetables and fruits, the building of huts and the care of children, pygmy women do a great deal more work than do the men. Several of whom we see here making arrows. Fire is used to straighten and harden the arrow shafts, which are made from small branches of certain forest shrubs and trees. Wood for bows comes from tough, springy native woods. When the bow has been completed, a string made of twisted, tough vegetable fiber is attached. The pygmies cover arrow points with a deadly poison made from the inner bark of the harota vine. After the outer bark is scraped off, the inner bark the fire, removed and crushed. The poison in the juice of this bark is deadly, quickly causing nausea and then complete paralysis. These men are handling the pulp with apparent carelessness because the poison is not effective unless it enters the bloodstream directly. This is why the small arrows, when smeared with this poison, need only to pierce the skin to become deadly weapons.
Another preparation for hunting, spear practice. One pygmy attaches a large fruit to a rope and whirls it swiftly at rope's length. The others attempt to hit the fleeting object by casting their spears at it. The target movement is much like that of an attacking or retreating animal. A well-aimed spear makes a hit. This hunter has cleverly concealed a deep pit along a forest pathway. The community is almost out of meat, so he makes a quiet trip to see if an animal may have fallen through the twigs and leaves which hide the pit. There is no game, so he returns to the village where preparations are being made for a community hunt. All members join in this and all share in the game secured. This pygmy is having his face painted by his wife. Wood ashes are used in this facial decoration, which is always a part of preparation for hunting. The designs are intended to give the wearers a ferocious appearance. As a final preparation, this hunter gives his bow a test and sees to his arrows. Note the different types of arrow heads, each for a special purpose. If the coming hunt is not successful, the pygmy village will move to a new location where game is more plentiful. The hunters are led by their sultani, or chief, and are accompanied by older boys who are learning this important activity. The chief has determined in advance the scene of the hunt deep in the forest. At the proper time, the Sultani calls a halt and dispatches scouts into the thickets nearby, silent hunters with keen ears and eyes alert for signs of game. One pygmy has brought along the precious fire, which is lighted for the group. A father and his son steal forth for a drink, using a leaf for a cup. The youngster's keen eyes wander over the scene, and he spies a monkey. Quickly the deadly shaft is sped, and the monkey crashes down. Monkey meat is a great delicacy to the pygmies, and we can imagine the lad's pride in securing the first game of the hunt. A short distance in another direction, two scouts have come upon fresh tracks of the pygmy antelope, a common food animal about the size of a rabbit. They signal their comrades. The group responds quickly and silently. One hunter sights the quarry. A truly accurate throw of the spear. Along with the vegetables and the monkey meat, the pygmy antelope will contribute to a feast. Another pair of scouts, alert even while drinking, have spied two tortoises. These toothsome delicacies are easily caught and quickly rushed back to the village. This will be roast tortoise, a food not far removed from our own turtle soup. After being roasted, the meat is removed from the shells, ready for eating when the remainder of the feast has been prepared. Large magongo leaves form good receptacles for the tortoise meat, keeping it away from dirt and insects. Thus, the pygmies have learned through long experience how to secure food and shelter directly from the tropical forest which they have made their home. In wandering through the vast dark forest about them, the pygmies long ago learned to collect honey stored by wild bees, to collect it for food and as an article of butter. Here they have discovered a bee tree, a giant liana or vine forms a natural ladder for those who climb the tree. Meanwhile, their comrades on the ground make a basket to store the honey. 
The framework is of interlaced vines, inside which leaves will be placed. The tree climbers use a smudge to drive away the bees, while their comrades finish their most practical receptacle for the sweet honeycomb. Although many pygmies lose their lives in such dangerous climbing, it remains a popular pursuit, for honey is a delicacy to their food supply, and beeswax is valuable as an article of trade. A little snack now, even before allowing their tribesmen in the village to join them. The leader hands round the delicious morsels to his helpers. The inner bark of the mulumbwa tree is used to fill the pygmy's clothing wants, which, as we have seen, are simple. After the tree is felled, the bark is peeled off whole, and preparations are made to separate the worthless outer bark from the inner. This is done by simply stripping it back, leaving the inner bark in one piece. This is folded back upon itself and pounded with a piece of solid ivory scored at the bottom. The pounding thins out the tough criss-cross fibers and is repeated until the cloth acquires the desired texture. This operation completed, the bark cloth is hung up in the sun. The warmth aids in expelling moisture and also toughens the fibers. Thus, the inner bark becomes a fairly soft, durable cloth provided by nature. Now for materials to dye the cloth. These pygmies are using a piece of cooler wood, which has a rich, warm, brown tone. They rub it upon the surface of a stone, applying water from time to time. When enough dye has been secured, it is rubbed well into the bark cloth until an even color is obtained. From this bark cloth, the pygmies make their clothing, and they sometimes use it for trade. With cloth, beeswax, and other articles of butter on hand, it is decided to go on a trading expedition. The Sultani now leads his men to one of the hiding places of their most valued possession, elephant tusks. Eager for a safe journey to the trading post, he warns of threatening clouds the approach of the rainy season. All speed must be employed. The tusks represent many elephant hunts. Although the pygmies are little more than four feet tall, they are exceptionally strong and are skilled hunters of the vicious African elephants. They often move their village in order to stay close to their huge quarry. Elephant meat is another of their foods and neighboring tribes provide a ready market for ivory. 